There wasn't really a title to my presentation in the program, so thank you for staying. Um, but I thought it was time to talk about what all this huddling is about. Um, can you put your hand up if you're huddling? So there's probably just under 50%. Um, keep your hand up if you know why. Yeah. Yeah, people don't understand why. So I thought it was probably timely to talk about that. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about paediatric safety. I'm one of those people that absolutely believe that one day we will cause zero harm to children who are admitted to hospital. Those of you that watch um, the literature in, in the safety area, anywhere between 16 and 10 children in every 100 admitted to hospital experience some kind of safety event. That could be serious or it could be simple as having, by no means simple, to have the wrong ID band on. Um, but we definitely have a problem and healthcare is one of the most unsafe places to be, particularly the acute care model. So huddling and all of the language associated with it is um, an opportunity for us to all get involved in something. And surprisingly, there's a significant amount of literature about this. Um, and you would have heard some of the language um, and, and some of it may be new to you. Um, for me, um, I have been um, interested in this area since... I read To Err is Human and The Quality Chasm, which were, big, which were books that were published in the US and they've really moved us toward that supposedly dirty word quality and it's become um, a big part of the way we fund healthcare um, and also a big part of, of what we choose to research. So the words you'll hear are about um, situation awareness, high reliability organisations, resilience, uh, psychological safety, um, depending on where you work, you'll call them paediatric early warning systems or you might call them between the flag if you're true Aussie. Um, you might call them track and trigger systems. Um, I don't know, some of you will know what a watcher is, some of you won't. Um, but really it's about keeping little people safe um, and supporting clinicians and being aware. And for me it's disappointing that not everybody in the room understands all of this because you're the people who are expected to be on the MET teams, the SERS responses, the second look, the second eyes, all of that. You're the people at two o'clock in the morning who need to know who these children are. And we haven't done a very good job rolling it out. So the beginning, and I'm really proud to say I met the man who started all of this. Um, so Cincinnati Children's Hospital is the sort of the face of huddling. Um, and prior to the development of the huddle, um, there were many places around the world that were trialling paediatric early warning scores between the flags, so those numerical charting systems that are colour-based that help us work out who might um, be moving towards uh, um, significant deterioration. And you can track them and you can um, observe it over time. Um, so those were, were well-developed. What Cincinnati Children's Hospital did um, was try and attach to those systems and processes that supported what we, we now knew. So PUSE is, a, or BTF, are bedside systems. Um, and they're systems that allow us to identify a child who is potentially deteriorating. And you will all be familiar with these age-based charts. Some places are electronically recording observations now and other places still doing them on paper. Um, they've had a significant impact. Um, and what they do is protect us at times when we're busy, staff are not necessarily well orientated or skilled and we can identify that child. Cincinnati kids realised that there were more opportunities in doing this. So uh, a guy called Patrick Brady, another guy called Stephen Muthing um, and Uma Cottigal, who were all clinicians there, moved in the direction of creating these systems and processes and they originally looked towards high reliability organisations. So organisations that were constantly, uh, were, were dynamic, were often in chaos, um, and, and needed to be reliable 24-7, and they also needed to be able to recover quickly, so to be resilient and not be changed by stress um, on the organisation. That's the challenge for all hospitals at the moment. You just look at access, it's a challenge. Um, but to be able to know that you're going to be just as reliable at 2 o'clock in the morning as you are at 9.30, um, is something that we would like to all strive for, and that's what they did. Um, and they um, created the impetus to move where we are. They kind of started their work in about 2009. They looked at aviation, they looked at the NASCARs, um, and they looked at the military, who historically have been huddling 
I was on a, um, when I was flying down here, I thought, I'm just going to see if, that, if those hostesses are going to huddle um, on Virgin, but I didn't see any significant huddling. So, but they tell me that's where it came from, and it's logical, very similar industry, where there's potentially high risk, things can change in a minute. Um, and that's where they looked, and that's where they based their original huddles on. What they, they did next is, is why they, they remain the most successful, despite us nearly being sort of you know, easily 10, 12 years on, they continue to be the most successful organisation in this, and it's because of what they did next. Um, and they published in 2012, they published in 2013. Um, they were one tertiary children's hospital. They've got over 500 beds. They've got um, a, about somewhere between about 45 and 50 ICU beds. Um, they have access. Um, they have a, a quality and safety institute. Um, they had resources against this, um, and they spent a lot of time um, and they, they were aiming for that high reliability mark. And the thing I want you to remember through all of this is that the gut feeling stays, and it's been, um, I suppose, inspiring for me to hear about the gut in the presentations that have been on today. Um, and they kept the, the clinician gut as significant. So what they did next was they decided they needed to identify the children that were most likely to deteriorate as well as the Pew score. So we already had that. We already knew what was going to happen physiologically or potentially we could identify that. Next, we wanted to look for what other things tell us that somebody might deteriorate and we should watch you closer. The two things that very quickly were identified were clinician gut. Uh, I don't know if, if you, some of you in this room have worked as long as I have, but we used to move babies up to the nurse's station just because we just had this feeling that things weren't going to be right. Sometimes the nurse's station was really busy with all the babies out of their rooms, around everywhere, because we were watching. And the doctors that would come would know why, oh, those babies are not well, because the nurses have brought them up, we should listen. Then the next one is parents. Parents know, listen to them. Incredibly important. Particularly in this climate of, of, of increasing complexity in children's illnesses, we now have children with hardware in them who've got um, complex, long-term conditions, and those parents are clinicians at home. They understand their children better than we do. So listening to them, when they say things aren't right, this is not what normally happens. We need to listen. So they identify clinician gut, parent gut. Then they went on to identify a few other things. So <clears throat> if you're getting chemotherapy given to you in the orthopaedic ward, there's a big chance we might make a mistake in a whole lot of different ways. We might have the wrong nurses, not the right doctors. We might not have the right equipment for handling cytotoxic therapy. Um, so if you're getting a treatment in a ward that normally doesn't deliver that, particularly a medication, then you're at risk. If you have um, leukaemia and you've been admitted to the orthopaedic ward, the chances are we won't necessarily know what to look for. So having an outlier on a ward where they shouldn't be creates risk as well. A whole lot of reasons. You're likely to get missed on the round, you're not in the place that you should be, the nurses won't necessarily know what they're doing. Similarly, if, if you've got a baby, a six-month-old baby on the adolescent ward where those nurses aren't used to looking after babies. So they effectively identified all of the things that they believed put you at risk. And the last one they identified was multiple communication. That was about how many people are involved in your care, how many teams and who's the lead team. Um, I know in the, in the institution I work in, not the Ministry of Health, um, that, that as soon as we add another team to your care, it becomes more complicated. And we've had many instances where someone came to see the child and the family, they wrote in the notes, they didn't communicate that to the nursing workforce or to the other team involved, and there's confusion about care delivery and risk that we might not start a therapy that you've prescribed, or we might do something that the alternate team said we shouldn't do. So these children who end up with a score are called watchers. These are children that we need to take special notice of, potentially put on a list so that 24-7 we're watching them and making sure that we've just got that extra ear to those kids. And the thing that remains consistent is that gut feeling, whether you think it's about the red flags that we become increasingly familiar with in our careers in the clinical paediatric world, I'm not sure, but that gut feeling is incredibly important and the parental gut feeling, even more so. So these are the first two um, pieces of work that um, were done by, led by Patrick Brady, Stephen Newding and, and Uma Cottigal. Um, and, and really this was about 
um, huddling for high reliability and situation awareness. So once you know someone's a watcher, what do you do with that information? And if you're a very junior nurse or potentially a very junior doctor, you might be a little bit frightened to escalate your concern because somebody else might not make sure that you feel safe in that. Most of you in this room will at some level have felt intimidated by somebody. I hope it wasn't a nurse, <laughs> although I have watched nurses. Um, yeah, <laughs> midwives. <laughs> no midwives in the room. Um, <laughs> But um, this was all about who do you tell, what do we do? So what they decided was at the aviation industry and, and the military um, do huddles, and what it was all about was right now, right here, right now, what's the important information we need to know to reduce risk, protect, prevent harm, or something occurring that we're not ready for. So they scripted a little conversation and they piloted on a ward, and this conversation was really about everybody in this space right now has equal voice, and we just need to go around and work out what are the issues. Initially, it was just about the watchers. What they realised was other people had vital information about things. And I can give you an example from my department where one morning the porter put their hand up and said, all of the batteries for the transport monitors won't recharge. It's pretty important information if we were going to take a kid to CT on a monitor and none of the batteries were charged. So very quickly it became clear that there are other pieces of information that are very helpful and they come from people who we often don't ask. So the whole aim of that little huddle um, is really about that information transfer and, and what do we know. <clears throat> um, and, who, and then the next step is who do we tell? So Cincinnati Kids developed a, a, re, a model that was micro at the bedside with the frontline clinicians, then um, a meso system and then a macro system, and all of that was about escalating to a level where somebody could do something about it. And they progressed, and over a three-year period, um, they ended up publishing um, their first results, um, and it was qualitative and quantitative. Um, they um, ultimately, the two important things are that they reduce their um, serious safety events by 50% and their unplanned um, admissions to ICU or, the, or what they call their unsafe admissions to ICU, which are children who are potentially already intubated or have already commenced an inotrope therapy um, by 50%. And they've managed to sustain that and they've reduced their sentinel events, so children that um, have died um, in the organisation um, with unplanned um, ICU transport or unplanned deterioration. Um, so I think the world saw hope, and I don't know how many of you were really interested in this, but I definitely did and, and, and very quickly wanted to try and um, replicate this. Um, the, the systems and the processes behind this at Cincinnati Children's Hospital are extraordinary. Has anybody in the room been there? No. I haven't been there either, but the, the, what they have and the, the resources they've put in are incredible. They have a senior um, safety officer who's a paediatrician who every day um, within the organisation, that's what they do. So the, the resources that were thrown at this were incredible. So the rest of the world went ahead and has made an attempt um, to um, get involved in this um, in the knowledge that what we were potentially doing is reducing that harm and moving towards zero harm. So the next thing um, is not so much an article, but it's important because all of these resources exist. A guy called Peter Latchman, who's a doctor, who's also the, um, I think, the chief executive of ISQA, um, he um, was very interested in this. At the time, was a paediatrician at Great Ormond Street and was also involved in the rollout of a Pew's situation awareness model in Ireland. Um, he became very interested, and, and with the Royal College of Paediatricians and Child Health in the UK, they've progressed um, what they call a, the SAFE um, collaborative project, situation awareness for everybody. Um, and they initially started with 16 um, sites. Um, I think half of them were children's hospitals and the other half were children's wards inside of um, hospitals. Um, and the aim was to spread it, collaborate, and to actually see what happened in different contexts, which is the one thing that, or, or a very big part of the one thing that Cincinnati Children's Hospital hadn't necessarily done, where they had lots of resources, lots of people, and one context. Um, so this study is still going. Um, they have released some papers. I'll talk a little bit about one of them. Um, and, and what they've found is that local context is incredibly important. And what happens in a community centre is very different to what happens in ICU. Um, and what happens in a, a big hospital that has 75% of its beds or even more are uh, predominantly adult um, makes your voice in, in paediatrics very small. Um, and it means that local teams need to work out how they want their huddle script to, to be. 
So quality projects work really well in this environment where you take that big piece of work and you have a look. How will this work for us? What's a watcher for us? What's important for us? Um, and increasingly, other places across hospitals are, are using huddles just to inform at the beginning of the week um, in the outpatient models. So um, spread collaboration, that site has everything you would ever need to start this um, and, and um, all the toolkits, resources, huddle scripts, um, uh, some evaluation tools, but generally a great thing. And they're slowly starting to publish their work. Um, <clears throat> then I, I ha had a look at how this was um, being received, I suppose, at ward level. And this is the first paper that I found that was published in, as a result of the SAFE project. And I suspect there'll be quite a few that will come out as a result of it. Um, and this is really about what one little paediatric ward did and how they evaluated it. And they, they um, started to get parents involved in a way that Cincinnati Children's hadn't necessarily. And they started asking parents what, did a, what was a good safety outcome for them. Um, and they started to have conversations with them. And similarly, um, the nurses and the medical workforce as well. And they started to evaluate the huddle a little bit. So did it happen on time? Did everybody come? Um, did it only last 10 minutes? Um, because there is a tendency for these things to, to stretch on and you need to keep the time for it to be functional and for people to come, for people to be engaged um, and to believe in it. Um, and, and I think this is what we will start to see about what they did at a local level and how did that work. So I would urge you to, if you're interested in, in this and you're working in a small site or a big site, have a look at what they're doing at local levels to make things work. And then the, the, I suppose the biggest piece of work I found is this one, which um, really had a big hard look um, at what the effect was. Um, and it was a systematic review and they found an um, enormous number of papers, over 1,200, and they eventually looked at 90 of them. And they were particularly looking at whether or not the Pew's scores, BTF um, models, actually made an impact. And disappointingly for me, um, they conclude at the end of this that there is some evidence, definitely, but what we need to do is um, put systems and processes across Pew's BTF um, scores that actually support it. So what they're saying is exactly what Cincinnati Children's Hospital did eight years ago, where they implemented something that had attached to it the opportunity to escalate the child's care, and there would be an ICU bed at the end, and there would be somebody to come and review the child, and they wouldn't question your need to have some support they would come and support you at 2.30 in the morning and give that child access to that bed. And that was the big difference. It's all about the resources. Um, so they identified over 2,000, as I said, they reviewed 90. Um, there were some favourable trends that were identified in, in the clinical and process outcomes. This is what it's all about, and I've already gone over time, and I'm grateful that this is giving me some minutes, but it's all about culture. It's all about believing in it. It's all about communication. It's all about confidence um, and, and giving the confidence and psychological safety to junior staff to speak up, put their hand up and say, I'm worried, and help them understand their gut or help them understand things. Oh, oh sorry. I, I could have yelled. Um, and then it's all about teams. People that work together often trust each other, respect each other, have each other's back. Um, and look out for each other. You will have experienced those teams. When you work in them, you never forget. Um, be brave enough to take that culture where you go. So in those huddles that you suddenly enter and you have that unique, I see it as an opportunity, but it, it's terrifying when you're in, in training programs where you change often your environment. You have to get used to a whole new team all of the time. And it's not easy and nurses can be, um, and I suppose, I speak for myself as well, we sometimes don't necessarily orientate the medical workforce to the environment. But every time you enter a huddle, create that psychological safety because it's really important. The other thing's about leadership and governance. Um, and, and I can't stress that. Somebody has to care about this, see this as a vision, make it matter, make sure that it occurs, follow up on issues around the huddle or around the response that are identified. People will lose faith, um, there'll be loss of engagement, it'll fall over and won't work. Um, so I was hopeful this would be published um, sort of 
today. This is supposed to be published on the 27th. This is just the abstract. It's another big study that actually had a look um, at uh, centres in Canada and also in Europe, and still the conclusion is unclear. But I'm hopeful that it's going to be published any time in the next few days, but it wasn't published yesterday. All I have is the abstract from March. Um, it's still not clear if Pew's BTF track and trigger systems actually make a difference. Um, it's still really important. Um, it's still a cause of preventable harm. In the RCAs in New South Wales last year, three of them were the significant recommendations were around um, improving the ability to recognise deterioration and improving communications. So it's not going to go away. Um, our, oh, am I going backwards? Yes. Um, so it's still not conclusive. Um, com we need to change things in context and we need to lo locally modify them. Um, Pews plus SERS plus situation awareness and further research will give us the answer. But the work that was done at Cincinnati Children's Hospital still hasn't been replicated that I can find. Um, communication, talking, learning and sharing. Um, resources and sustainability um, are incredibly important if we're to care about this. Um, Patrick Brady, who's the doctor who, who I met and who drove all this, he says this, this is his quote, and um, that children don't suddenly deteriorate clinicians suddenly notice, and that um, is incredibly true. I mean, you look at the distraction in our environment now as we move towards an electronic record and a host of other things, increased complexity, turnover flow, um, then we're very distracted, and we need help in recognising this. Thank you. Thank you.